Um, so I'm going to start uh, by asking you your experience in the last 24 long years at Google. Um, I'd love to know, um, love for you to speak about your recent, like all the different roles at Google and what you've been doing for the last 24 years. A lot of things must have changed. 24 years is a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, over the course of my career at Google, I've, I've bounced around to a bunch of different things. So for the first few years at Google, I really worked on, you know, I, did, I created our first advertising system uh, and then spent a number of years working on our core search indexing and crawling and, and re retrieval systems. Um, you know, I think that was a very exciting time because our traffic was growing very fast and we had to sort of uh, wake up every Tuesday and worry we would melt because we had too many queries. And so what could we do to like make the system more efficient, uh, but also make the index that we're serving to users much larger and updated more often? Um, you know, I think that was, that was uh, exciting. We had one of our colleagues who kept a little crayon chart on the wall of how many queries we handled every day, and like it was always going up, and he kept having to rescale it down because the paper was only so big. Uh, and then I worked for a number of years on kind of uh, what I'll call distributed systems infrastructure, things like storage systems, uh, ways of expressing computations, things like MapReduce, uh, and then sort of higher level storage systems like Spanner or Bigtable that kind of sit underneath lots of Google products and enable them to, you know, uh, rely on the same abstractions and regardless of whether it's, you know, maps or search or, you know, ads or our cloud products. Um, and then about maybe 12 years ago or so, I got interested in how could we train very large neural networks. Um, I'd actually got exposed to them as an undergrad when I was doing research uh, at University of Minnesota. Um, because it felt like a good abstraction, like neural nets at that time, there was a wave of excitement in the late 80s and early 90s uh, about what they could do because they could seemingly solve you know, interesting but small problems in ways that other approaches could not. So I got really excited. I'm like, oh, we, if we could just make these problems, you know, these neural networks you know, 100 times as big, they would be amazing. Um, so I did some research on how do you apply parallel computation to training neural networks uh, as an undergrad. Uh, turns out we needed more than the 32 processors in the department machine uh, to make these neural nets actually really powerful. We needed like a million times as much computation. But then we started to have that, you know, in like 2008, 2009, uh, with you know the advances of of computing in Moore's law and you know special purpose processors like GPUs or or other. Uh, specialized processors, you suddenly had the ability to make neural networks that could do, uh, you know, solve problems that we didn't know how to solve in other ways, but real problems, not just toy size ones. So I've been working in that area for a while. Uh, most recently, I've been co-leading the Gemini project, which is our kind of our latest uh, large-scale multimodal model for all kinds of things. Sorry, that was long-winded. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't long enough because for those of you who might be intrigued by what Jeff just said, I'd highly recommend this article in New Yorker. Was it 2018? Um, the friendship that made Google huge. Uh, and I remember my daughter read that article. And uh, when I told her that uh, I'm going to be talking to Jeff, I mean, I was interviewing for this role, so uh, Jeff was interviewing me for that. Her respect for me went way up. <laughs> oh, you're getting to talk to Jeff Dean. Uh, so. Uh, that was also played a very positive role in my life. Uh, so Jeff, back to uh, where we are. So there's so much hype around AI and kind of we've made so much progress, right, since the, those deep learning advances uh, of 2000, about a decade, slightly over a decade ago. So how would you describe this moment in AI? This moment, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, really what you've seen over the last decade is just continued expansion of what we imagine computers can do, right? Because 10 years ago, we wouldn't have thought that you could have computers that can see or understand speech nearly as effectively as the models we have today. And I think you're starting to see the ability for these systems to sort of uh, comprehend much more complex structures, uh, you know, not just a sentence, but like take in a whole document and kind of be able to summarize it or be able to extract information from it. You know, these, these are fields that have been worked on for many years, and we've made some progress in some of, the, some of those fields. But I think when you start to look at the ability of these very large models that are trained in a very general way across, 
you know, text and images and video and audio uh, to be able to accomplish general tasks rather than what has happened, you know, prior to that, which was generally if you had a machine learning problem, you would train a model to do that very narrow specific thing. You might go off and gather very specialized data to do that. Now what you're seeing is these general models can actually accomplish many, many of those tasks that you previously would have had to do a, you know, month or month long, you know, special purpose training of that model. Now you can just ask the model to do it and it can do it. And I think that that really unveils a new way in how we think about interacting with computers and working with computers to do things we care about. Uh, and in fact, I remember distinctly you, uh, just four years ago, I think we had organized the research week with uh, students. And Jeff was asked this question by one of the students. What's this one thing about today's AI models that you don't, you're not, you don't find satisfactory? And that, that was exactly the answer you gave to that student, that, that for every new problem, right, we end up building a new model from scratch. And this is not how we humans, right, Yeah, learn. we don't do that anymore. And so, Progress. So, so you predicted that uh, at that stage. Of course, you were already working on some of those <laughs> things, but, but it's sure. great to see that coming to fruition. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, and I want to follow up with, um, on the flip side, where do you think this technology is going? What is, what is our goal? Yeah, and where are we heading towards? What's next? Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing kind of a very broad spread of uh, machine learning and AI uh, in many, many fields of endeavor, right? Like you're seeing, you know, nearly every field of science, people are thinking about how could, you know, a learning-based approach, learning from data, uh, impact this sub-problem in our field, or maybe a whole bunch of sub-problems could be simultaneously solved and really transform how you how you think about it. Doing that, and you see that in you know chemistry and material science, and you know uh, uh, sort of chip design and education and healthcare, and you know every other field. I think people are excited about the possibility, but they're also, you know. Uh, careful and wary because these technologies are, are not, uh, you know, right out of the box going to solve these problems. It really requires domain expertise, understanding the limitations of what these models can do, but also the possibilities. You know, it's also good to look at, you know, not what they can do today, but where you think they're going to be able to do what they're going to be able to do in five years from now, because I think that's where the field of AI and ML is going and where all other fields are going to be going is what are the possibilities that are unlocked and will happen over the next five to ten years. Very nice. So uh, one of the things that I often think about is that we are living in such amazing like times, right? Uh, if I look at the evolution or maybe revolution of AI where it has brought us, right? On one hand, we have these LLMs which have just amazing capabilities, right? Which have taken the world by storm. And on the other hand, there are so many fundamental problems with them, right? The problem of factuality or hallucinations, alignment with human values or like reasoning and so on uh, that are still unsolved. So how do you look at this duality? And again, do you have any advice for all of our wonderful AI researchers in the audience? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's good to be both not overly like there are no problems because there are definitely issues that you pointed out, things like factuality or bias or, you know, collect, training training uh, a model on one data and data distribution. Then when you apply it in another setting, things are very different. And so the model, it doesn't perform the way you want it to. And uh, it, it's really important that everyone sort of thinking about applying machine learning, both machine learning people and also people in different kinds of domains, be thinking about this and understand the the kind of rough edges that can that can happen when you do that. The kind of uh, fallibilities of these models. Uh, at the same time, I think there's also been a lot of progress on things like factuality. You know, if you look at the models that are, you know, present in, today, you know, the factuality of these models is actually significantly better than the ones even a year or two ago. And so I think there's definite progress in a lot of these areas, but it is by no means perfect today and so continued research progress on you know nearly one of every one of these kind of areas in outlined in our AI principles uh, you know Google has a set of seven AI principles you know nearly all of those are sort of active areas of research endeavor like how can you improve factuality of models or how can you lessen bias in these models 
Um, and so I think it's important to continue to work on those areas, um, but also give it, despite the shortcomings, what can the models do and, and how can you make sure that you, as you say, maximize the, the benefit while also working on some of the, the shortcomings? Thanks. Thanks. Can you say something about the kinds of architectures for these models that we going, is the current set of architectures set to stay or do you expect any radically new um, forms coming up in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, let me, let me describe the current state of the world, right? Like right now, these foundational models, you tend to like collect a bunch of different kinds of data and you train these models in a you know, you know, month long process or a few month long process in order to get them to a state where they can do a bunch of things. Um, and that's a very static thing. You then take this, you know, the checkpoint of the model that's been trained and people can go off and do all kinds of things with it, like a bunch of different teams at Google, then take the checkpoint, they might deploy it directly and use it in their product, they might collect a bit more data and fine tune the model on, you know, this problem or that problem. Um, but the problem with that is, if you have 100 teams doing things with these models, that don't, the, the, the way in which they're applying it doesn't make it back into that core model. Right, it's like a very one train once and then you deploy a bunch of ways. And I think we really need to move more, much more to a more incremental learning kind of system where you're all continuously working to improve a single model and different groups or different people who care about different kinds of functionality can collectively work on this without getting in the way of other people who are working on improving some other aspect of the model. You know, people who are working on making the model better for medical applications shouldn't interfere with people who, but allow simultaneous improvement in other areas, like maybe machine learning for code completion or something. Uh, if we could have a system where everyone was collectively improving the same model, you could incrementally extend the capabilities of the model um, rather than these kind of monolithic large training runs that then get uh, propagated downstream, I think we'd be in a much better state. And so incremental learning, you know, ways of training so that, you know, one new task doesn't interfere with another, doesn't make it so that you have catastrophic forgetting of what the model used to be able to do. Um, all those are really important research areas, I think. Okay. So Jeff, uh, we've seen a lot of progress, right, in this space, obviously. And, um, but it seems like compute and data have become even more important, right, in the current paradigm than ever before. So what do you think are the research questions to address be going beyond scale? And I'm sure the academics here in particular are very strongly interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I will say it, it is definitely the case that like training on more data and that requires more compute and also a larger model to absorb the knowledge in that much larger training corpus definitely has helped. But I think it's also a little, uh, under-realized how important algorithmic advances are in improving the capabilities of these models. You know, we've gotten maybe factors of 10 improvement over the last few years from more computation, you know, more powerful computation per, per watt or per dollar or whatever. Um, but we've probably gotten a factor of 10 as well from algorithmic improvements, you know, things like model architectures or better uh, filtering mechanisms to identify what data is going to be most helpful to train on so you don't spend your compute cycles training on things that are not nearly as useful as, as other things. Um, and a lot of those kinds of things can be proven out in ways that don't require large amounts of compute. You know, we actually do very small scale experiments to evaluate, you know, what is the value of this data set or this particular kind of data versus others. Um, and uh, you know, that's the kind of thing where I think there's a huge value to have wide and deep exploration of a whole bunch of different approaches and techniques. And when you demonstrate those ideas at, you know, even small scale, a lot of times they, they do carry over. I mean, we do notice, we do experimentation at a few different scales though, because what's really important is not are you improving at this scale, but what does the trend line look like as you're ramping up in scale. So you might have a teeny model, a little bit bigger model, and a slightly bigger one. And if, the, if you're all above the kind of baseline that you're comparing to, but the slope looks a lot worse, that's not as interesting as something where even if you're below the baseline, but the slope looks amazing. So as 
as things scale up, it looks like that might dramatically overtake the, the baseline. That's, you know, an interesting result, uh, even though it might not seem so because it's like below what you're comparing to. Yeah, so plenty of inter interesting, right, problems to work on. Grace? Um, so as chief scientist of Google, I know that you like to do the technical work, some of the technical work yourself. I'm interested to hear what you're working on yourself that you're particularly excited about. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different areas. I, I'm particularly excited about these kind of more uh, sort of incremental learning techniques and um, different model architectures that can make that possible. Uh, I think, uh, you know, models that are much sparser than the ones today are probably gonna be important. Models that you can incrementally add, add capacity to are gonna be important. Um, identifying what are, uh, you know, useful pieces of data to train on. Could you have an automatic assessment for different data sets or different examples that assess how much uh, uh, value you get out of those? Seems like a, uh, an area direction we should go in. Um, Right now, it's a little bit more ad hoc, and you do some small-scale experiments that are designed by humans. But if you could have more automated uh, approaches in that space, that would be exciting. Um, yeah, and just general, like how do you make the iteration time for research faster? You know, uh, you know, you'd like to not have to wait three minutes for your your sort of machine learning computation to to launch and start giving you results. If you could do that in twenty seconds, it would be better for everyone. Thank you.